things are good. Yeah, yeah. I just spent the more, you know, every morning I, I go to a cafe and I write. That's where, where I write my books. So I just got back and got a little lunch. And so, yeah, I'm good. So your, your brain's all uh, tweaked and uh, primed? Totally, totally. <laughs> it's all tweaked and primed, absolutely. I don't know if you, if you had a chance to see any of the interviews that I sent you that I've already done. No, I haven't. I actually had an intention to do that. It's just, you know, I just came out with a new book this week and oh, so it's, it's just been, I've been overwhelmed, overwhelmingly busy. So I just never got around to it, but and that's fine. Yeah. yeah, no problem. It's just, I do have a certain format that I kind of go through and it kind of follows its own flow, but, uh, but I'll, I'll get started the way I, I get started with everybody, if that's okay sure. with you. Yeah, yeah, totally. So my first question is, how would you describe the present state of the world? Oh, well, wow, that's an open-ended question, but what immediately falls into my head is that it's a world gone mad. We're having a collective psychosis, and um, yeah, and it feels like we're approaching some sort of an event, an event horizon, where everything feels like it's converging in, in a way that's unsustainable, and something's gonna gonna unfold that might be unexpected. But I think the main, you know, for me, the major point is is the the psychic epidemic, the collective psychosis, and that's what I wrote my book about. Right. Well, that, that leads to always to my next question because the the, the first answer that I, the answer that I get to the, that question is always leads to conflict. It seems that conflict is at the core of of human endeavor, and so I I, I would like to ask you, what are we an innately conflicted species? Would you say is it part of our evolutionary process? Well, I would say that when you inquire into the nature of our mind and who we are, that intrinsic to that nature are opposites. And, um, you know, at a certain point in, you could say, our spiritual or the psychological sort of like the evolutionary process, those opposites become, in a way, sort of adversarial. But what I'm continually discovering in my own life is that when you really are able to hold that creative tension that could turn into real conflict that those opposites, you know, in alchemy, they talk about, it's called the coincidentia um, oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites. They actually more and more um, show themselves to be not necessarily polarized, but actually in a way secretly allied and indistinguishable from each other. So I think the key, the key thing that I want to get across is that there's a way of, of holding that creative tension that something actually creative and positive can emerge. And if you, are, if you aren't able to do that, if you split, you know, identify with one of the opposites and sort of try to repress the other, you develop not only a symptom in yourself, but that just perpetuates the polarization and the conflict that's in your own soul it gets actually played out through the medium of the outside world, and that's what we're seeing today, and you know, sort of collectively in mass. Well, can you describe those opposites? Yeah, well, they can be described in a multitude of ways, whether it's dark or light or good or bad or whatever. But I immediately think of, I mean, for me, a perfect symbol of that. You know, here I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm like this this Jewish person, brought up Jewish, who does Tibetan Buddhist practice. And yet I'm really into contemplating Christ symbolically as a symbol. And symbolically, the crucified Christ, I think, is a perfect symbol of holding those opposites. He's torn between the opposites and the crucifixion. But by, in a way, sort of hanging in there, by not splitting, and like I was saying, you know, having an identification with one of the opposites at the expense of the other, out of that, he, he actually becomes this transcendent symbol that um, is really, and a symbol, interestingly, what a symbol does, it brings together the opposites. So it's the opposite, the word symbolic is the opposite or the antonym for diabolic, which is separating and to divide. And sim symbols are the language of dreams. So symbolic awareness is the language, when you realize that this, that th this is like a collectively shared mass dream that we're all moment by moment creating and conjuring up, dreaming up together, and you realize, oh my God, this universe is an oracle and it's speaking symbolically, which is, which is dream speak. Okay, that kind of brings up um, 
the forces at play here. So how would you describe then, like the forces at play on the big picture, since we are all just, just kind of uh, living out forces that we barely, barely understand, but we reflect in our actions. What are those, what are the forces at play within a human being, would you say? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I mean, just like a dream, we're the, we have multiple dimensions to our being. And on one level, there's the personal dimension with all of our, oh, I have these unhealed conflicts or wounds or traumas or whatever. But then there is on a deeper level of the personal is like the, the more um, the archetypal. But the way to get to the archetypal is by fully going into the personal and the thing which is interesting, because, you know, in my book I talk about, oh, there's this, this you know, the Native Americans call it um, Watiko, and it's an actual disease. It's a virus, in a sense, you could think of in the mind, but synchronistically. So it's an inner um, phenomenon. It's an inner process that actually explicates itself through the medium of the outside world, synchronistically. So it's, it's an inner condition of our soul that actually it will express itself in a non-local synchronistic way through the outside world, which means that the way to actually access that inner process that's going on inside of us is to recognize how our inner process is synchronistically getting actually reflected and expressed through the medium of the outside world. When you begin to see that correlation, that's when you're stepping out of just the personal identification and you're realizing, oh wow, I'm actually um, interconnected with the whole universe, as are we all, and that there's a deeper pattern or process, that archetypal dimension that's unfolding and actually showing itself to us through us, that we become the instruments through which that deeper archetypal process acts itself out. And the whole question is, do we recognize that or not? So is that how we develop our archetypes, each one of us, to delve within the self? I mean, isn't that the paradox of life, really, that you need to transcend the self and yet at the same time you need to perfect it? Yeah, well, like, like I, you know, the way I would answer that is that it's through really coming to terms with. So, because one of the mistakes people make is they hear about the archetypal dimension and they want to, oh, that sounds really cool and mystical and exciting and they want to right away go to that, but then, but then but potentially they can be having an avoidance of dealing with their own personal process and their own personal issues. And, um, you know, so it's through dealing with our own, you know, really going deep within our own personal process that we access that archetypal, um, you know, sort of, it's, it's kind of like a higher dimension. And, but it's interesting because when you connect with that, you actually begin to see through your, you know, whatever, whatever identification you had in a limited way. So you begin to see through that. It's like, oh, all of those are like these, these identity patterns that aren't really who I am. They're just constructs. And when you connect with the, with the deeper, the archetypal sort of, you could say, dimension, you begin to realize, oh, wow, by being this is something that's coming through that's informing everything that's informing all of us and when you see that it snaps you out of feeling alien or feeling isolated from the world or from each other or from yourself and you begin to have the realization wow we're actually interconnected and interdependent and the expression of that realization is compassion when you see that inseparability of yourself from others from the universe the expression, the energetic expression, like I was saying of that is, is, you know, real compassion. So, you know, compassion is one of those words like love that, that uh, there's a lot of different interpretations of. How mm -hmm. would you interpret the word compassion? Well, in a sense, it, it's an expression of, you know, um, snapping out of the separate identity to the point where you have the recognition that we actually don't exist in a separate way so therefore whatever somebody else is going through in a sense you're going through it they're not separate from you so if they're suffering you're suffering with them in a way and so that come you know the compassion has to do with just that it's like you know just it's our nature to just when we see 
somebody who's not separate from ourselves who actually is ourselves and they're in suffering that you want to just help them um, in whatever way you can. But I want to just make a disclaimer because a lot of people, um, you know, in in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a, a coin, uh, this phrase that's coined called, um, you don't want to have idiot compassion. And idiot compassion is just a smiley face. Oh, we always just have to love and pat each other on the back and all that. And that's not necessarily the real compassion because, you know, when you talk, when you're talking about real compassion, quite oftentimes it can be really fierce and it can set boundaries and um, it can connect you with being this, this, this warrior. And, but the whole basis, even in Tibetan Buddhism, they'll have these, these, these deities, the, um, the, the, that are these, you know, the, the people peaceful deities, and then there are the ones that are really the wrathful deities, and they look like demons to the Western eye, and they're all fiery and filled with rage, but their essence is compassion, because sometimes we have to actually access that part of ourselves, that, that, that part of ourselves that is potentially, you know, connected with anger or wrath, um but channeled through our compassion that that's really an ultimate form or just one form of compassion, you know? So, so in, in distinguishing compassion and understanding, for instance, um, we'll get into a bit about the Watiko virus because that seems to be at the core of, of, of everything that we do. Um, mm -hmm. But that, there seems to be a, a, a tremendous purpose for that pressure on us, just as death has a tremendous pur pur purpose on us. It gives us a sense that we have a limited time to get things done. And we have an innate sense of wanting to get something done, to grow, to, 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 to expand ourselves. Um, so it seems that, that there is a purpose for the Wetiko virus in, in enhancing our awareness. Would you agree? Oh, no, there's definitely a hidden teleology or purpose that built that's encoded in the virus. Definitely. You know, in my book, I point out that if it didn't exist, if the evil of the Wetiko virus didn't exist, we would have to invent it. Right. That is right. necessary. And that encoded in the Watiko virus, it's actually helping us to wake up to the dreamlike nature. And so it's kind of a quantum phenomenon that there's like this, this superposition of states that the Watiko virus, whose source is within our own mind, um, is the, the source of the deepest and darkest evil. And at the same time, in the superposition of states, hidden in the Watiko virus is the is its own medicine, is this blessing that it's actually helping us to wake up. And same thing in quantum physics. When I said it's a quantum phenomena, well, you know, when you look at what is the nature of light, is it a wave or a particle? Well, it depends. How do you how do you observe it? Same thing with the Watiko virus. If you just are in touch with the evil of it and then react in that way as if it's evil, well, your reacting in that way is going to then um, help it to manifest in its in its full blown in its evil qualities. But if you actually have the recognition, oh wow, what the evil that I'm seeing in this Watiko virus and that I'm seeing in the world is actually this reflection of my own evil. Then all of a sudden you're beginning to access you know the real healing that's encoded in it, which if you really go into that, it can actually help you to wake up. So, so as you peel away the layers of, of that virus, we'll say, um, do you find, how do you find distinguishing, like we'll get back to compassion here for a second, how do you distinguish reflecting your own pain onto another and, and calling that compassion versus a, a, a more understanding that, that somebody needs to go through pain if, to some degree, to get to the state of, of, of transcending it. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Does... That's good. yeah, yeah, that's a good question because, you know, on, on the one hand, sometimes we need painful, you know, si the, the situations to grow. But on the other hand, so when you see somebody, like one of the things, the, one of the ways of thinking about Watiko, and just let me say, you know, what the, for people who aren't familiar with the term, it's it's like an indigenous term. The Native Americans coined the term to connote the spirit of evil, and um, and it it's underlying um, really any sort of an addictive process, you know, or any sort of trauma. And the thing is about like whether you're talking about trauma or you know an addictive process or pain, there's a certain 
um, phase where it becomes like self created and unnecessary, but the person is so in a way in a habit pattern or conditioned, like think about trauma, the way we try to heal from trauma creates the very trauma we're trying to heal from in an infinitely self-perpetuating feedback loop that's total and utter madness. That's what trauma is. That's the pathology of trauma, but encoded in that acting out the trauma, which is the symptom, encoded in that is actually potentially the healing because something's wanting to complete itself. It's like we're trying to get closure on a process to unlock that energy that's bound up in that compulsion to repeat itself. And so when you see somebody enacting that, and that's like unnecessary, and, and, and they're actually, it's a slow form of suicide, it's a self-destructive process, that's the situation where you can, whatever skillful way you are able to, to maybe try and help the other person. But then there are other times where, you, you know, almost like a parent sees a child and they're making a decision, and maybe the parent thinks, oh, well, it's not their best decision, but if you have like maybe some form of higher intelligence, you might see, oh, well, maybe they need to go through that and that's how they need to learn. That's different. So it's important to differentiate and make the distinction between we have one word like suffering or pain, but there's all these different, you know, these levels. You know, um, I, I read Carl's Custanetta when I was about 15, 16. I was in a, in a state where I needed to find some kind of answer. I was playing with the Bible a bit and then I... I Someone gave me a book, Tales of Power, and from then I just went off in that direction. It, it, it resonated with me completely. Right. And, and of course, the, the, the flyers are, are, was one of the major components that, that kind of... That's um, very similar to Watiko, the flyers. Exactly. Right. It's the same yeah. thing. It has to be, right? Right. Um, totally. And you know, everybody that I ask, uh, all the people I've interviewed, I, I always ask them, particularly, and I asked the Buddhist Rinpoche this as well, if in their tradition... There is an understanding that there there are such things as orga inorganic beings that prey on our awareness to some degree or affect us, such as the Watiko virus, and 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 the the the, the Rinpoche who I interviewed kind of smiled and and wouldn't answer the question, and I find it interesting because I know that, that you have a relationship with with Buddhism and and you, your couple mm -hmm. of your teachers are are lamas I, from what I understand from an email yeah, that you had yeah totally um, is this is this something and, and also you were very wary to make sure that, that I'd read your book so that I didn't think you were a crackpot or something. Or, or, or you know, to, to just be fluent in what I was wanting to talk exactly. about. Exactly, because it's way out there. It is. I mean, this is not, this is, this is sci-fi to, to the masses. It's not, it's not something that it's people... Funny, it's funny when you say it's way out there because immediately I thought, oh, it's way in here, actually. It's not right. out there. But anyways. Right. I'm talking about the, the perspective that, that you'd be no, dealing with. Consensus reality, it's way out there. Totally. Right, right. Period. So how do you break through something like that so that you can have a, an intelligent discussion with somebody. I guess what I'm saying is that this 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 veil that's over everybody's eyes to, to see things only one way. Um, you're writing these books, obviously, to put a little kink in that armor to make people start seeing it with with new eyes. And and the truth itself can find its way through there, even written through your words. Which I have to say, you're a very eloquent writer. You're you're mm. I, I I am. When I read something and it talks clearly to me, I recognize it immediately. Carlos Casanova did that for me, and your writing does that for me. I have to say that oh, that, oh, thank that you. you have a very, very eloquent way of, of 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 flattening knowledge and making it making it making it linear and reasonable and and elegant. So I just wanted to say that to you that that uh, I, there's very few authors that I've read that can do that, and and you do that, and that's oh, why I wanted you. to speak with you. Sure. So I forget yeah. what I was asking you after all that. Well. Yeah, well, it's interesting. One of the there were two things that you were asking me because I was tracking it. Good. One was you brought up this this question that you always ask people about: are the are there these, you know, whatever autonomous or objective beings called the flyers or like you know the archons or what you go? And so, how about maybe I'll answer that first? And like you would ask this Rinpoche, and he didn't really say much, which I totally understand. Right. And but I, I actually want to attempt to answer it because being that this reality is is like this multidimensional is multidimensional on from the absolute level there's no such thing as like whether you call them flyers or archons or watiko or negative ETs or devil or anything like that the ultimate point of view absolutely that those entities don't have any objective independent intrinsic existence separate from our own mind. But 
on the on the that's the absolute point of view. But from the point of view of relative reality, they exist or they have to be dealt with. If you just think, oh, I'm just going to assume the absolute point of view, they don't exist. That's like there's a contagious disease and you're going to say, oh, well, actually, ultimately, it doesn't exist. Well, then you're going to get infected. You have to take precautions on the relative level. So on the relative level, they're as real as we are from the relative point of view. And, and the thing which is interesting, but absolutely from the ultimate point of view, they don't exist. So here's something, either whatever name you call it, the Flyers, the Archons, Watiko, whatever, and which actually doesn't even have any intrinsic existence whatsoever, and it can destroy our species. And that's pointing at something. That's pointing at the incredible untapped power that we have within our own minds and within our hearts and soul um, that we're not aware of, and then it gets turned against us. Now, keep in mind, these entities, you know, and when I say entities, I'm actually talking about from the subjective point of view, we experience them as if they exist objectively, as if they are an entity, but from the absolute point of view, they actually don't exist. So, well, what I want to say is they can't, they can't, they don't have any power over us. They can't steal our soul, but they can trick us into giving our soul away, okay? And, you know, all of this, of course, is what I really delve into in my book, because like going back to Castaneda, what Don Juan says about the flyers is, um, you know, they're the topic of, it's the topic of topics for shamans. It is the most important thing, and I concur, because it's the very deeper process that's playing out in our world that's destroying our world and destroying all of us, and yet encoded in its manifestation is this revelation. That's, in essence, what my whole work is about, is trying to, like, point at that. It seems that we have to always be continually under pressure and pushed, that, that consciousness always has to be pushed. Do you get that impression? Well, I mean, when you say that, you know, just to associate as if we're having a dream, you know, in, in the alchemical art, in the opus, the magnum opus, there's typically the container, the hermetic vessel, in which the prima materia, the raw material, you know, which is really like the rejected stuff, you know, the darkness, the chaos, that is in the hermetic vessel. It has to be hermetically sealed. And that's the, the very substance that if you don't have that, you can't make the alchemical gold, which is consciousness. But if you put that in the vessel and you seal it, there has to be fire underneath because the fire creates pressure. And so if there's no pressure in that vessel and there has to be, it has to be hermetically sealed, because if it's not hermetically sealed, it'll blow its lid, and then we'll just project out all of our unconscious stuff onto the world. Um, so there, but there has to be a pressure buildup in that in that container for the prima materia to transmute, to transform into into the lapis, into the gold. And so, yeah, what you're talking about and what I've just been describing—that's really an archetypal process that's built into the nature of who we are, that all of us are, or we're, we're all acting it out, whether it be consciously or unconsciously. So that brings me to this, this whole concept that, that, that's popular these days of, of love and peace. That seems to be an end goal for a lot of people. And, and, and my impression is that that's, that's just as one-sided as the opposite. That what you were talking about earlier, that balance between, between expansion and contraction, or whatever you want to call it, that is more of a, a, a tense sort of balance. What do you think of the whole New Age movement these days, and where it's where it's going? Is that what Tico driven as well? But as but a sort of a yeah. subtle. Right. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, you know I'm in a process with the New Age movement at the current time. In that the big New Age bookstore in the town I live in, you know, I just came out with a new book just within the last week. And, um, you know, it's my own personal story. It's the companion volume, really, to the to Dispelling Watiko. And where I'm really, you know, I went through an incredible trauma and my own personal encounter with the evil of Watiko. And I actually, in this book, I'm, I'm really telling my story. And they won't, carry, they won't carry the book. And even though I'm on, I, I teach there and I've been speaking there for over 20 years, they won't carry the book because, oh, we don't carry books like that. You know, it has the word evil in the title. 
And so I think what you're getting, you know, to is that um, like a lot of the new age movement, I mean, they have this real, there's, there's this wisdom in it up to a point. But like I think about this bookstore as a perfect um, example where they're overly identified with the light and they just don't want to have anything to do with the darkness. They And their, their story to justify that is, oh, well, if we put our attention on the darkness, we're going to be feeding it. And there's some truth to that. But it's only a partial truth because, and I write about this in Watiko, because the same bookstore wouldn't carry Dispelling Watiko. Uh, and then at a certain point, you know, um, they kept on getting all these special orders for the book and they decided to carry it. It's a whole long story. But um, what I point out in Watiko, because I tell the story, is that, oh, it's one thing, you know, yeah, we don't want to overly focus on Watiko or on evil you know, and so from that point of view, yeah, there's truth to new age, you know, um, whatever, like people or bookstores not wanting to put too much focus on evil. But it, the, on the other hand, if you're in avoidance of it, if you, oh, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to give it the time of day. I don't want to give it my attention because you're avoiding relationship with that part of yourself that it's reflecting. You're actually unwittingly feeding evil by doing that. And I bring out there's a third option, and the third option is to see it, is to see the evil of Ortico. And then as a sovereign being, you are you have a choice. You go, oh, okay, I see you. I don't want to invest my energy in you anymore. I want to invest my energy in creating the world I want to live in. That's to truly empower yourself, and that's to, to take away any power from Ortico. So, yeah, so I feel the New Age movement... Um, you know, not, I can't talk for everyone, but I mean, a lot of it is just really, you know, one-sidedly off and I've been, and I'm part of it. I mean, I'm very, I'm a spiritual, I do practice, I'm a Buddhist and, you know, all that stuff, but it's, it just kind of makes me sad because it's very well-intentioned, but it can be really surface and very like the superficial wisdom without really going deeper. Well, then, let, let me, for let people me, who haven't oh, read your book. Would you mind just describing the characteristics of a Watiko driven person? Sure. Okay. Well, um, one, you know, there are so many ways I can describe that, but what comes into my mind is that, um, you know, we, we are these multidimensional, these, these beings who one part of us is you know this archetypal dimension and another you, you know a similar word to archetypal is daimonic the daimonic which sounds negative but the inner meaning of the word daimon is the inner voice is the guiding spirit so it's actually a very positive thing and the thing about the daimonic energy it's archetypal in that it can possess the ego it can literally take over a person and then unwittingly the person who's taken over becomes an instrument to express that that daimonic archetypal energy now the daimon it's related etymologically to the word um you know finding one's vocation finding one's calling hearing a voice genius genie as in i dream of genie the inner voice the guiding spirit all of that is related to the daimon but if we turn away from that daimon if we don't enter into conscious having a relationship with it consciously, it becomes negative and becomes a demon. And so then, because the daimonic energy can possess us, we then unwittingly become, like I was saying, an instrument, and that's where that, that addictive, compulsive energy, we then just act it out with total unawareness that we're like actually taken over by something that's other than ourselves, and quite often when we're in that state where we have like a righteousness and we think we're, I'm totally feeling who I am and most myself, when in actuality you're in a sense being an agent and your secret is secret even to you because it's happening through your unconscious. You see, and that's the way Watika works. It works through our blind spot, through our unconscious, and to the extent we don't see it, then we unwittingly act it out in the world and I'm describing one person, but imagine when 7 billion people are doing that. We don't have to imagine that. That's what's happening in our world today. You know? And I would imagine even that self-righteousness that you spoke earlier, that on the surface looks like it's a benevolent uh, characteristic, 
Underneath right. it all, it is very self-serving, and it's very and like you say, it, it's it's ju- it, it's filled with justification for itself. Yeah, 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 totally. No, and that's why, you know, so often, I mean, you know, people in power. So the people, there, there's a correlation between people who are um, taken over by Watiko and who find themselves in positions of power because our culture really. It's hard to, you know, go up the ladder, the corporate ladder, without, in a sense, being part of the Watiko culture and playing the Watiko game. And then you get, you know, there are like all these benefits. So, of course, then unconsciously, you know, you're more and more stepping into that energy and there becomes a counter incentive for you to self-reflect because for you to see what you're doing, you have to realize, oh, my God, I've, I've been out of my mind. I've actually, you know, kind of been insane. I've been compl- colluding and complicit with evil. So there's a counter incentive to reflect upon the perversity of your circumstance. And then what happens when you're in those positions of power? Yeah, typically you can sleep really well at night because you've justified it in your own mind. You're not, you know, you're not feeling guilt or anything like that. Because in essence, part of being taken over by Watiko is you're disassociated from your heart, from empathy. And, um, you know, so it's a state where when somebody, and there are all these, these, you know, when we say somebody taken over by Watiko, you know, that's like a phrase, but there are all these different, like, whatever you call it, like, degrees of that possession. But in full blown, when somebody's fully taken over, they're literally the embodiment of the disease. So it's like they're not even this human being, even though they look like a human, but they're a portal through which the actual higher dimensional disease is revealing itself. So from that point of view, they're a treasure trove. They're a gold mine of information. That's actually how I discovered it, because my father was such a character. He was completely taken over, and I was the recipient of I'm the only child of him acting out. But thankfully, I was taking notes and drawing maps and trying to track what was happening. And because he was so taken over, he was also my teacher. He was showing me what the actual disease looked like in a particular human form. But being archetypal, it it looks different in everybody. But when you see it in one person and you really understand what the, the deeper level that's informing the manifestation is about, then you begin to develop the eyes to see it all over the place. Yeah, I had a similar experience. experience. Right. My father was my my example of Watiko as well in our family, and uh, and right. from a from a very early age, it was evident that 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 the contrast of of what he was with what I felt, and and uh, and trying to resolve those those um, discrepancies between what the world seemed like to me and how it, I felt like it it should be, right. whatever that means to a kid. Um, that was been my journey as well, and that's what led me to this interview with you as well. This has been that journey. Right, right. And I, I'm thinking out loud, too. So I just came out with a book. You know, it's like a, a 600-page book, and it's all about my father process because, you know, I knew before I died because it was such a trippy experience. It was so out of the ordinary that I knew I had to, um, you know, to publish it, to write a book about it. And because my biggest fear was I didn't want to go through that experience and not be able to share it with anybody because there was real... There is something good that comes out of it. There's like teachings if you're able to share it in a way that can help other people. So yeah, the, I, you know, it just came out this last week. So what what is your um, experience on a day to day basis? How are how is your struggles with um with with that inner conflict? How how is that how does that go on a daily basis for you? Do, is it is it a fifty fifty process? A seventy thirty? Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I mean, now keep in mind, I mean, I'm in no way am I an enlightened person. I mean, I'm dealing like all of us with our, my own stuff and, you know, with, you know, this incredible trauma. I mean, you know, that's what I write about in my book. And, um, but one thing that I'm really thankful for is that I've connected with, I found my voice and my, and being creative. So every day, like even right when we began talking today, I said, oh, yeah, I've just been at the cafe all morning just writing. I'm writing my next book on quantum physics. And I'm very thankful because if I haven't, if I hadn't found my creative voice, then I would feel, then I would, I would be in trouble. Then I would have a big problem because, yeah, I feel, you know, just on a, you know, on an everyday basis, um, this, you know, the wounding, you know, the trauma, the abuse, and not only on my personal dimension, but also, 
you know, being empathic and open, I mean, that's in the field, that's in the collective, that's in the world. But I'm thankful because instead of it being necessarily problematic, I'm able to hold that or to experience that or to bring consciousness to that in a way where it will literally inform and give shape to my creative expression. And so, as you know, it's because of that that I, I tell people I have to create every day. I mean, I, my whole, my, my, you know, every day is, the whole schedule is around, you know, me just um, tapping into and expressing myself creatively. And it's not just my own process. I went with all the people who I work with, I see that, you know, people who've really gone through their initiation, their ordeal and are suffering, that if they haven't found a way to creatively express themselves, then that can be really problematic, you know, and it doesn't make a difference what medium. Right. I was trained as an artist, you know, as this visual artist, I never would have imagined I'd be turned out to be a writer, but yet now for the last number of years, I'm writing these books. And so it's not important what medium it is. It could be doing anything, just as long as you're doing it in a creative way, you know. So in your personal life then, do you find that, um, I mean, how do you deal with, as you mentioned at the beginning, an, an insane world? I mean, when you're, when you're dealing with people, and, it, and it's obvious that you're dealing with, with a, a wall, um, do you try to, to do, you, do you just react to that wall, or do you try to get through to the being behind it? In other words, do you, do you go about life as, as controlled folly, to use a Don Juan term, or do you actually try to connect with everybody? Yeah, yeah. No, and I mean, and I see one of the models that teaches me this are my teachers, because they are these genuinely enlightened people, and I, you know, I've known them for so many years, you know, since the early 80s, and, and what I, I'll see them do again and again, they'll just meet people right where they're at. If somebody's a real advanced practitioner and a scholar, they'll meet them there. If somebody is totally a beginner, they'll meet them there. They'll meet, they'll engage the person right with where the person is at, where the person feels really seen and met. And so, yeah, I'm continuing, you know, because I have all these, whatever, clients and, you know, these groups that I do. So all week I have all these people that I work with. And, you know, with certain people, I'll really try to, if I feel they're open, to reflect oh, well, maybe what I'm seeing as far as in their blind spot, their unconscious, or I'll challenge them or, you know, play in a certain way with them. But when I am with people who I feel, no, they're not at the place of being able to do that, they're not open, or on the contrary, they'll even have like a violent reaction if you hold up a mirror reflecting their unconscious. You know, in Tibetan Buddhism, they'll talk about it's important to have skillful means. Right, right. And from that point of view... Yeah, maybe I won't say anything, and maybe I'll just embody or carry what I'm seeing. I'll just like, you know, even holding it in my mind. And quite often, just that itself on the energetic, you know, sort of dimension has some sort of non-local effect, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are, are you, do you consider yourself a one-man show? I mean, one thing that's coming up a lot in my life these days is, is, um, is that... The new, the, 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 a lot of people suggest there is a new era, that we're at the beginnings or in the middle or towards an end of something that's, that's like you, you alluded to earlier, that there's a dramatic something mm -hmm. taking place. And uh, a, a lot of people that I respect suggest that, that it's, there, it's, it's time for, for the archetypes to, to recognize themselves and connect with each other. And that's where the power of change will come from. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, like I'm trying when you were asking me if I'm a, I'm a one-man show, I just, I'm like a little bit stuck on that. Like, wh what do you mean by that? Well, like, let what, me, is, let me, what, what I meant by that is, do, do you get a sense, are you, in, are you part of a, a, a community of people that, that you can be as, as open as you can be with? Or do you find that, 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 that you're an island amongst insanity, that you've got a few, you know, a few other islands out in the world? Or, or do you find that you're... Right, right, sure. Oh, yeah, no. Well, what I've done, I've been really fortunate... So part of my whole process is that, you know, so here my father was a really sick guy and I was the one who was tracking that. And then unbeknownst to me, you know, I was picking up the voice of, you know, shining the light on his pathology and on his darkness. And I didn't understand the, these dynamics uh, at that 
time when I was younger, but I quickly became the identified patient. In other words, the person who, oh, if only we could shut Paul up, or he's the one who's sick, or he's the one with the problem. I couldn't believe how the whole field protected the abuser, you know, my father. And so basically, to make a long story short, I've been excommunicated from my family. I, ha I haven't had any contact with my family, you know, for a long time. But I've created this incredible, like a soul family. I have all of these groups. Like this past week, I had four groups, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night, you know, of all these different people. And they're all friends. We all become super good friends. And, you know, they're... And, and, you know, it's not it's not even like I'm necessarily in the role of teacher. It's a circle, and I'm one of the people in the circle, so it's a community. And I'll openly share my struggles, or I'll get triggered, and then when I'm triggered, I can't facilitate because I'm in my unconscious, and maybe somebody else will facilitate. So we all pick up all the roles, and that's a really wholesome community. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, I'm thankful in that, because what if there's anything I'm trying to get across is that we're actually not separate. We're actually interconnected. And when you come together and hang out in a certain way, that's not based on, you know, the will to power of the ego and of the shadow, but you actually have the recognition that we're interconnected, inter interdependent, that if I help you, it helps me, you know, then all of a sudden, that's the idea in Buddhism of the Sangha, of the community. And that's one of the supports for enlightenment. So I've been fortunate in that I don't at all think of myself as, oh, I'm just this one, yeah, I have my own work and my own particular, you know, voice and slant on things, but I'm just one of many people, and thankfully, I have a lot of friends who are also switched on in the same way, and we can all help each other, definitely. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and so, so, then how do you see these times from this point of view now, of, of, yeah. of what's, what's going on, and what, what, what you think needs to evolve? Yeah, yeah, I have I have a particular point of view about that because from the dreaming point of view, because I always, you know, try to access the dreaming point of view, being that this is a dream and, you know, it's not metaphorically like a dream, but no, this is a dream. This is like, just like you can, in a night dream, have lucidity and wake up in the dream and recognize it's all your own energy. The same thing is available to us in our waking dream. And when I see what's happening in that way, what's happening in the world, it's clear that, oh, wow, this incredible darkness or evil that typically has been like underground or hiding in the corners is just coming out and it's, it's visible for all who have eyes to see. It's not hiding itself anymore. And from the dreaming point of view, that's an expression that there's incredible, powerful light that's nearby. Because when there's a manifestation of shadow, shadows are a manifest or an expression of the absence of light but they're also an expression of the presence of light. So the fact that such a deep shadow is actually manifesting and materializing in our world from the dreaming point of view is an expression that there's this incredible light that's flooding into our dimension. And um, I think that's really important to have access to that point of view because it's so easy to just fall into despair and get seduced by the darkness and then just get depressed and feel impotent and feel, oh, it's hopeless and pessimistic. And when you have that point of view of pessimism, you know, by the nature of, of this being a dream, whatever viewpoint you hold in a dream, the dream spontaneously shapeshifts and reflects back and gives you all the evidence con to confirm your viewpoint in a mind-created spell. So that's the danger of if you become really absorbed in a pessimistic point of view, and so I'm not just one of these overly new agey, optimistic, oh, everything's light and love and cotton candy. No, things are beyond horrible, you know, but yet, you know, if I want to be a, actually a benefit to the world, I have to keep connection with my own heart and see, yeah, there are so many people who are awakening, you know, almost like there are these little, like, you know, these nodes around the planetary mind that are awakening. And what's really crucial is for us to connect with each other. Because when you connect those dots of light, um, you know, the, the, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts, it's what I call, we can, it's a conspiracy theory. We can conspire to co-inspire each other, to activate the collective genius in a way that's, that we haven't even been able to imagine as of now. But that's what all of this is about, is that more and more of us are waking up, connecting with each other. And, um, you know, and when one way to understand this, if I can, like when you're in a night dream and if you actually have lucidity in a night dream and recognize, oh, my God, this is all a dream. This is all my own mind. Well, that's fine and dandy. But what if 
a second person in that night dream, one of your dream characters, an aspect of you, they also have that lucidity and you connect. And what about a third or a tenth or a hundredth? And you all come together and you contemplate what you're understanding, what you're having the realization of, i.e. that we're all having a collectively mass shared dream. You discover you can put together what I call our sacred power of dreaming, which is the intrinsic power we have to dream this dream into materialization, and you can actually change the dream. And that's evolutionary. And that's what all, and I'm describing a night dream, but that's available to us in the waking dream, what I just described in the night dream. And that's what all of this is about. Well, when I was saying before, oh, we just have to recognize what's, what's being revealed to us, that's what's being shown to us. It's being shown to us through the negative manifestation of the Watiko epidemic, but it's only manifesting in a negative way because we don't recognize what it's showing us. As soon as we have that recognition, then we can actually, in a way, we activate our, you know, um, creative, you know, sort of agency as dreamers of the dream who can literally change the dream. And that's not new agey woo-woo stuff. That's what all of this is about. That's what my work is about. And people understand that on a day-to-day -day experience. When you meet somebody you connect with, you get an energy boost. You get a confidence and energy boost and, and, and elevate that to the standard that you're talking about. And it's, it's obvious that it'd be a powerful... Right. And one thing energy. about that, that energy boost, when you meet somebody, to answer your question a little while ago of how would you describe somebody who has Watiko, it's the opposite. When you hang out, and keep in mind, if you think, oh, that person has Watiko and I don't, then you've fallen under the spell of the bug because the bug feeds off of polarization. We all have it in potential. It's, it's, a, it's a virus that exists in the collective unconscious of our species. But the point, I guess the point I wanted to make is that it's different than when you hang out with somebody and you get energy and you feel inspired and creative. When somebody at a given moment is, is really you know, channeling the Watiko bug, it's contagious and it's a field phenomena. That's another thing I talk about in the book. But the point is, it's like being around like, like, you know, if you're with like a vampire, at a certain point, your energy starts feeling drained. That's like an embodied way of, of really kind of tracking, you know, just maybe what might be going on in other people is how you actually feel when you're around them. And, he, and even that can be an illusion at times as well, because sometimes they can feed each other with Tico people. Is that not so? Oh, totally. You know well, what I mean? Like, that, yeah, that, yeah. like, it, like it seems that, that you have to constantly, we are constantly refining our awareness of ourselves. And that you, as you peel back the layers, even something that you might have assumed before was, was an enlightened state, you'll re be revealed to have been under the same illusion. Yeah, well, one of, we all have an incredible, like this genius, for a self-deception. We're really good at pulling the wool over our own eyes. And I'm talking from my own experience. I mean, it's mortifying when I catch myself, I'll be convinced of something being a certain way. And then at a certain point, I'll inquire into it and I'll realize, oh my God, I've just totally fooled myself. And I was convinced of the objective truth of it. And that's important. That cultivates like a humility right. to realize, right. oh, at any and every moment, we you know, we have to, you know, just not blindly trust our perceptions because um, it's so easy to fool ourselves. And particularly if somebody at a given moment has, you know, was taken over by Watiko and they'll connect with another person who's taken over by Watiko, they're both going to see each other as incredibly enlightened, right. you know, right. and, and they'll see other people who don't have Watiko who are reflecting back that they do. They're going to see right. them as crazy. Right. So, because the thing about Watiko, it works through our perceptions. It works through the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that it hides itself from being seen while simultaneously acting itself out through us, you know? And the thing about Watiko, it literally can't stand to be seen, just like with a vampire can't stand the light of day. That's symbolic. Because when you see Watiko, when you see, it's because of this that I wrote a book about it. I'm trying to say, look, Here's, this is the map. This is how you actually recognize it, you know, how it's out in the world, how it's in yourself, how it's in your relationships. It's all over the place and in between everything. And when you begin to see its covert, its operations, then you, you've taken away its power and simultaneously empowered yourself. Right. Critical mass. Um, I don't know how you view, how do you view that, that what's possible for this world? There's, uh, there's seven people, there's seven billion human beings on the planet or something like that. Right. Uh, I can't imagine seven, million, seven billion people are going to come to the awareness of, of who they are within the context of 
of the universe. Um, right. But for, for change to happen, uh, whatever kind of change that we're feeling, um, what do you say is the critical mass for that? Yeah, yeah, and that's a, that's an interesting question because it just brings up images, you know, the hundredth monkey phenomena, or in the in, in the Bible, um, they'll talk about uh, the symbolic number one hundred and forty four thousand, which to me is some. It's all some, you know, it's like it's the same symbolism that there's a certain critical mass that's reached that that actually changes the collective unconscious, and one an image that comes up is like if you have like if you take these this sugar, these granules of sugar, and if you dissolve them into a glass of water, and they'll just, you know, one by one, you'll put this little granule of sugar in, it'll just dissolve, it'll dissolve, and then it reaches the saturation point, and you add one more grain of sugar, and a crystal will magically appear in that moment. And that's a beautiful image, I think, of any one of us could be that grain of sugar, and by us self-reflecting, in this moment, or recognizing our shadow, or seeing Watiko, I mean, there are all these ways of saying it, but just having a moment of consciousness could be that grain of sugar that non-locally actually expands the consciousness in the collective unconscious to the point that could precipitate an entire global awakening. And I think that um, if who's to say whether that will happen or not, it's certainly in the realm of possibility, but I think it's important to hold the viewpoint that that is true. And that we might be that grain of sugar right now, and um, because that just seems in alignment with with everything, you know, with this being a dream, yeah, that's the way it seems to work. You know, I'm just in, interviewing a, a fellow that is very much into a geometry and how it relates to um, consciousness, and, and Metatron's cube is a big thing for him, and, and the 144,000 is a big thing for him as being the critical mass because it relates to the points on Metatron, Metatron's cube that there are 12 basic archetypes, and within that there are 12,000 variations of that, blah, 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 blah. That, that as these people uh, hone their own uh, self-awareness, that, that it does create that crystal. So it seems like there's a lot, of, a lot of people approaching what's going on from all these unique archetype angles. Um, and I, 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 my, the, the fun part for me is I get to talk with people like you and, and hear, hear these archetypes, uh, that have are quite developed on along their line, and hear what what their point of view is this space and time. Um, I wasn't really going anywhere with that. I was just sort of sharing my uh, my yeah, joy no, that, right now these days. But yeah, 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 that's awesome, totally. When you, when you find yourself in in a in a contracted state, and, and you're recognizing that you're you you've suddenly come under a, a, a cloud, how do you recognize that, and how do you get yourself out of it? Yeah. Okay. No, that's a good question. You know, and, and so keep in mind, so I'm, I'm a practicing Tibetan Buddhist, which means, you know, I do, I do practice every day, you know, um, and um, yeah, I, I, you know, on a daily basis, guarantee, you know, at least from my own experience, there are moments where I'll feel, you know, caught up or stuck or contracted or obscured. And, um, you know, and part of my training you know, is, um, oh, if I then see that, like that moment of like, say, self-contraction or obscuration or feeling stuck or just feeling screwed up, you know, there are a lot of ways of describing the same. I'm sure everybody gets what I'm pointing at because we all can relate, I think, at least in my imagination, um, that how I hold that is key. Because if I, if all of a sudden I have that moment of feeling really screwed up, and now I have all, from one point of view, oh, I have all the evidence I need that I really am screwed up because look at how I'm feeling. So then I get even more further entrenched in my identity pattern, oh, that I'm wounded and traumatized and all that, which might be true on one level. But if I'm holding, if I then identify with that point of view, then I'm actually investing in the, the reality of that. So then being like a dream, my experience will then reflect back the truth of my point of view. That's that whole, that self-perpetuating right. feedback loop that's created by my own mind. But the other, the other, on the other hand, that same moment of, of feeling stuck, feeling screwed up, whatever, however you describe it, comes up. And if in that moment, if I have, if I'm in touch with my awareness, and if I have the realization, oh, wow, that's just this deeper, shadowy, unhealed part of me coming up so as to be released, so as to be consciously experienced it, 
in Buddhism, they'll talk about the emptiness of it, that it doesn't actually have any intrinsic existence separate from your own mind, that, but it has to be done in the moment. You can't just think about it even a second later, that in the energy in, that's informing the, the actual, the emergence of that negative state, you just have the recognition, oh, wow, it, by its nature, it's just going to liberate if I don't actually grasp to it. Because in my book, you know, my book is really an incredibly deep, in, you know, this inquiry into the nature of evil, personally and collectively. And what I'm pointing at is that not only an evil is encoded like its own medicine, but that the root of evil, the very root source of evil is our own grasping, is our own clinging onto a reference point, be it the reference point of that we exist in, in an egoic way that actually isn't true, or that phenomena exists objectively, independently of our own mind, that grasping, that clinging, that's what that is what ego. That and and I talk about this. I really go into this in the book, and that will will like actually express itself through the multiple dimensions of our being so that it gets played out collectively on the world stage in the greater body politic. And that's what's happening. So to the extent that any of us can really practice in oh just creating a little bit more spaciousness around when that grasping comes up because it, it really becomes like a vicious cycle, you know, and but when you actually see that grasping in yourself, you know, that's wanting to like identify with the stuckness, instead of seeing that grasping as the obstacle, oh, I need to get rid of that, which is a hidden form of Watiko, you realize, oh, no, that grasping, instead of being an obstacle to my realization, that's the expression that my realization has taken in this moment. That means you can, you're embracing your experience which is to say you're embracing the part of you that isn't embracing, which is the all-embracing state, and that's to be lucid, and that's the, the, the Watiko dissolver par excellence, and the expression of that's compassion. So you see, that's, that's like my deeper answer to that. And that's the subtlety, isn't it? Is that the, that the actual experience of that changes it automatically? Yeah, yeah, totally, you know. And, um, and so then from that point of view, any of like the seeming manifestations of our own, you know, like blockages or Watiko or, you know, sort of like this evil part, it's all actually secretly allies. It's all actually teaching us stuff. Like one way of understanding this collectively, take a look at what we're doing on the, in the world stage. We're, we're destroying, we're literally destroying ourselves. We're, we're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet. But what I point out in my book is, well, how come we're doing that? Well, and I point out we're doing it so as to as, as to as to to actually teach ourselves how to not do it, which we clearly haven't yet learned how not to do it, or we wouldn't be doing it. So the idea is is that the actual acting out of the pathology is the very way that we transcend the pathology. It's similar to like in trauma. The the symptom of the trauma, the repetition compulsion, encoded in that is the very solution. You see, it's that same thing that encoded in the evil of Watiko is the blessing. So I don't know how much time you've got, but but there's all, all uh, there's always another level I'd like to take this to. Um, sure. If and as far as time, just know I have somebody coming in about a half an hour. We're going to go for lunch, okay. and I'm happy to go till then. So there, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Now hopefully, it won't take that long. But um, yeah. but okay, the big picture, the big picture. I mean, you've got a firm grasp on on the struggle of of an individual being on this planet, human being. That's my. That's how I see you. You've got to, You you understand that. You experience it. You're fighting. You're 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 working your way through it. Now, on the bigger on the bigger picture of that of of what we are really, um, how would you define us? Do you, would you say that there is a, a supreme intelligence, a, gr a grand design, or a, a god of some kind? Yeah. Well, I would say that you know we all interface with this with this deeper intelligence. You know, like whatever you call it, like, you know, I mean, I wouldn't call it God, but God would be one descriptor for it, you know, or just wisdom or something like that. And, um, I mean, you know, just to associate what comes up for me, like when I write my books, for example, I feel like I'm just an employee because I'll wake up in the morning and, you know, so I go right to the cafe, you know, and, but before I, I get to the cafe, I get these downloads about, oh, here's what you're going to write about and here's how you're going to write about it. And, you know, and, and it's like a part of me that's not me. It's not my egoic voice. It's some sort of higher intelligence 
that, um, and I've learned to distinguish between when is that just my own like ego just tripping compared to when do I need to pay attention. And, you know, I've just developed a, a facility to sort of differentiate um, when is it my own chatter, my own thinking compared to when is am I actually, you know, in, in, a, in a place where I'm hearing some guidance. Because keep in mind the um, daimon, the daimonic energy, the daimon, it's the guiding spirit. It's, you know, and, um, you know, so that we all have a part of us that's connected with the transcendental realm. And the idea is, you know, you can call it just the self with a capital S. And the idea is, is, to, is to develop relationship with it. You see, and that's one of the dangers when people say they'll do like a psychedelic experience or they'll have an awakening and they'll all of a sudden have like this living experience of the self. One of the dangers is they'll immediately identify with it. Oh, I'm Christ. I'm God or whatever. And yeah, and that's almost like, you know, that's, it's, it's inevitable in a sense that that happens at first because we have to have a little inflation. The way I see that is like when you send like this, you know, like if you want to break the Earth's atmosphere, there has to be like the rocket fuel to break out of the atmosphere. But then, you know, that, you know, it fall, you know, those canisters fall away. If that inflation doesn't fall away, then it becomes pathology. But yeah, we might have a little inflation at first when we connect with that higher self. But then, you know, if it's not a pathological um, process, you realize, oh, wow, I can actually cultivate a relationship and have dialogues with this and it can teach me. And, um, you know, that's been my experience and I'm not alone. There's tons of people who have that experience who talk about that. And um, so that would be the way I would answer that, that we actually are all interfacing with some form of higher intelligence and our job is to cultivate relationship with that. So that, that's, yeah, that's kind of where I was kind of going with that, that question was, was how responsible are we for our actions? In other words, how much of what we do is, is the universal imperative acting through us and how much of it is actually something called free will? Um, what's your opinion about of free will? Yeah, no, and that that's a, a really, I mean, that's a, you know, that's not an easy question to answer. That's a deep question. And, um, you know, I mean, it makes me think like when somebody, okay, one way I'll answer that, when, when somebody is really taken over by Watiko um, and part of the quality of that experience of being taken over is that you act out compulsively. It's like you can't help it. You can't restrain yourself, you know, um, from acting out in the way you do. And, um, you know, there's not a sense of choice. There's a sense you'll have an impulse and all of a sudden you just find yourself like acting it out in a compulsive way. That's like, um, you know, I'm talking about like addictive habitual patterns or behavior. And so the opposite of that, because one way of understanding stuff like Watiko is to contrast it. Like, oh, what is it? What? It, well, we can figure out what it is by figuring out what it's not. Well, if we're not in that state of being taken over, you know, by, in a sense, by our unconscious in a way, by Watiko, um, then, you know, on any given moment, there will have a particular thought or, oh, I want to eat that thing, I want to do that thing, or an impulse to do something, but then there's space, there's spaciousness around it, and then we can, like, actually, oh, well, let me think, do I want to do that? Is that actually my thought? Is that my belief? Because the thing about Watiko, it's like, it's like, when I was saying it's like um, mind virus, or a parasite, or like a tapeworm, and a tapeworm, think about it, you get a tapeworm, and at a certain point, it will inject chemicals into your system that you'll start craving food that'll be feeding it. So it grows bigger, and you're the host until it eventually kills you, and then it has to find another host. And all the while, you're thinking you're acting on your own impulses, but it's actually this other like entity that's in you. And so in the same way, when you develop more of an awareness and you get freed to whatever degree from Watiko, whatever impulse you'll have, there'll be more spaciousness, you'll be of more, have more choice, and you'll also be able to like, to ask yourself, well, gee, that's interesting, do I really feel that way? Like, you have a feeling, is that my feeling? Is that my impulse? Is that my thought? Instead of just being, you know, so many people are just identified, whatever feeling or thought or perception, they just assume, oh, that's what I think. But who's, you know, that 
opens up that whole deeper question of who's who's thinking that is it you or are you taking on somebody else's per perspective so it just opens up a whole deeper process you know but i think as we get free from watiko we more and more become our own sovereign agent and our own creative you know having an agency and so i would like to think that that does interface more with having free will compared to just being because when when somebody's taken over by watiko they become like an automaton they literally become like a zombie and all the while they have no idea they think oh i've never felt more myself right but isn't that is that kind of the one of the paradoxes of of enlightenment is that it takes willpower to get to to acquiescence yeah you know i mean i i wouldn't know much about enlightenment but um you know, yeah, I mean, as far as the willpower, it definitely involves like a real having this discipline. I mean, like I was saying before, I do practice every day and there's a certain like, you know, this discipline and intention to do that. Um, but this, I guess one thing just to associate for a second in, for example, in any sort of like a spiritual practice, if we're doing what we're doing, like say if I'm going to be doing my spiritual practice right now, and if I'm doing it because, oh, I want to, like, you know, make myself feel happier or alleviate my suffering, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But that's still, like, in this, in this like, this limited sphere where if I actually have the awareness or the intention of, oh, I'm going to do whatever practice I'm doing now um, for the benefit of all beings and that I want to really, I'm actually dedicating whatever healing that I'm getting, I'm imagining that everybody is sharing in that benefit, you know, in, in, in Buddhism, they'll say, oh, then your practice, you know, will be so much more powerful because holding that viewpoint, that is the viewpoint that snapped out of the separate self, that snapped out of the clinging that you exist as an alien, isolated entity. And that's actually this point of view where you're having the recognition of our interconnectedness and, um, you know, inter that we're interdependent with other beings. And that that is the enlightened point of view. So I just wanted to say that, that, you know, having that intention of really wanting to serve the whole, you know, because it's almost like taking the narcissistic fix fixation off of our own self and off of our own suffering, paradoxically, then like creates more spaciousness for ourselves not to suffer. Where if we're always like thinking about our suffering and how to heal it, that becomes like a form of narcissism that literally reinforces the very suffering we're trying to heal. Right. right. Kind of where I was going at the, originally with that question too is with bringing up the God is that is that we, everybody talks about how we're destroying the world and how 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 obviously you know our, our effect on the world has been devastating in many ways. Now, but but a lot of people have an emotional response to that, uh, a judgment that it's right or wrong. Um, I, I'd be, I, I've, when I spoke to the Buddhist Rinpoche, I was hoping to get see how ruthless he would be, like how, how ruthless he was, but of course he, he wouldn't reveal himself to me, as by the question of whether there is such a thing as, as flyers or inorganic beings, he wouldn't yay or nay it, because he didn't want to, I, I would assume, he, my impression was that he didn't want people to think that he's nuts, right? They're here to give a message and to start with baby steps for people to get them on their road to start examining themselves, so he wouldn't go right to, to something like that. He would, he would alienate a lot of people. But as far as the ruthlessness goes about, about Buddhism, or anybody who spent uh, uh, millennia examining our purpose here, is the, is the earth here to be saved, or is it here to be the... To, are we supposed to have a sentimental value of interconnectedness with the earth, or is the earth a spiritual being just as we are, and that once we feel that interconnectedness, it, it automatically becomes a spiritual experience, and, and the earth is just was just a playground that needed to, to, to hone that. Do you, do you know what I'm kind of getting at? Are we getting stuck on, on the, the practicalities of what we're doing here and letting that be another Watiko um, sticky point that's, that's, that's keeping us in a bit of despair and judgment? You mean as far as getting, getting stuck with like you were saying, like, you know, with thinking about the earth. So, well, okay, here's what, what comes up for me is that, um, you know, the earth is our home and there's not going to be a human species if we don't take care of our home, you know? And, um, so yeah, I'm aware that there are spiritual people who feel like, Oh, it doesn't make a difference. What happens to the planet? You know, it'll regenerate over who knows how long, but I, I feel like, no, it's super important 
you know, it's, it's, it's our, it's our mother, you know, mother nature. And it's, it's really important um, to honor that and to take care of that because we're not separate from that. We're part of one whole system. You know, it's like the whole, you know, biosphere. We're part of that and we have a responsibility, you know, to take care of that. And, it, and, and then, you know, it's a reciprocal relationship because then it takes care of us. So, I mean, it's really concerning what's happening, you know, from the, you know, the ecological environmental point of view, definitely. Can I, can I can I act as a as not as a devil's advocate, but as a yeah. uh, as a contrast? Um, yeah, yeah. When you say concern, isn't that always a cue a, cl a clue that Watiko is present? Do you know no. what I mean? Is that true or no true? Yeah, that's not true. No, I mean, is that just, feeling of contraction of concern? Is that is that um, is that a Watiko uh, um, um, or a flyer? Um, what do you call it um, when you have a sickness and you uh, you have a uh, like a symptom or a symptom, something? A symptom, yes. Yeah. No, not at all. I mean, you know, um, I mean, if like if you have if you're a parent and your baby is walk, you know, is crawling towards the edge of a cliff, you know, you're going to be concerned. That's not a Watika response. That's a wisdom response. That's the enlightened response. So the fact that somebody has con somebody has concern about a circumstance isn't necessarily itself anything having to do with Watika or not, you know. And um, I mean, and that's, you see, that's why it's hard to really sort of get into focus, Watiko, because it's not like when you have the flu, oh, there are certain symptoms and it'll look like this and you can really like quantify it or, oh, your symptoms, they match what the book says and, oh, you have this diagnosis. It's not like that. It'll appear in a different way with every single person. And, um, you know, with some people feeling can concern might be an expression, oh, that's a, a symptom of they, they have Watiko disease. Other people know it's an expression of their enlightenment. And um, so it's not just like, you know, that sort of easy thing or easy process to diagnose, you know, and, and the fact that we all potentially have it. So if you're thinking that, oh, they have it and I don't, or, you know, it, it you know, and, and I go, of course, I go into this in the book because it's like a whole new way of holding the nature of health and illness, really, right, right, you know. Right. So is, but it, uh, let's go to fear. Is fear at, is at the basis of all Watiko strategy? Is fear the... Um, well, right. Well, the thing is, you know, it's interesting because my teachers, you know, these, these great enlightened teachers who I know and, um, you know, for so long, and they'll always talk about, oh... You get to the place of no hope and no fear. They'll always co-join hope and fear. And when they, whenever they say that, I get such a transmission that they're talking from their own experience, that they're at that place, you know, because I really feel, oh, wow, they feel that they don't really have fear or hope. Right. They're just so in the moment in this at ease state. And... Um, but now the thing about Watiko, Watiko, it actually one way because there's like a multiplicity of ways of describing it, and that's what I do in my in my books. But um, one of the ways of describing it is that it feeds off of fear. So the if you think of it like a bug, um, it will cultivate fear in the field, and one of its organs of propagation is the mainstream media. So you turn on the news every night and within like one minute you'll hear terrorism, terror, 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 terrorism. You know, and it's cultivating fear in, in the unconscious of our species. So the Watiko bug, it both like cultivates fear and then feeds off of people's fearful reactions as a way as its food, as it, that's how it feeds itself. Okay, so definitely. So that's, that's where I was coming from with concern because I've been examining myself for 40 years um, intensely. Uh, with the conscious understanding of, of the flyers and the effects of the effects of, of the counterbalance of my my fear and my concerns and for me concern is always fear based that's why I was relating it concern oh, okay. do you see what I'm yeah. saying like it's a contractive thing it's not like you see somebody near a cliff and and you you don't get that contractive state but you just go and do something about it in other words there's there's options of reacting so I was trying yeah. to see if the subtlety of of Wetiko, from your understanding is any concern. That there's another way of approaching that very same moment that would be just as alert, but not have that concern. Does does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I think it's just a question of. Um, so you're. Yeah, I didn't understand how you were using the word concern. Right. It's a, 
it's a semantic thing. No, totally. That that makes sense. More. And that's what yeah. I'm relating to the world. That there's a lot of concern for the world. And is that? And and uh, I'm wondering if that's that same subtlety that that we were talking about the new age movement and, and the self righteousness that's kind of underneath a lot of what they they do. Um, is that not the same thing that con- that a lot of this concern is based on? Do you know what I'm saying? I know it's taking this to a whole other level that people don't really like to. The, the earth is sacred, so it's hard to talk about that. But is it? Is there? Is there? How many layers does Watiko go in our understanding of almost everything we do? Is basically what I'm saying. And, yeah, and, yeah, it's uh huh. And that, and what I was asking earlier is like to 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 recognize it. Do you, what are the c- clues? Is concern always a clue? Is fear based anything always a clue that Watiko's back there somewhere manipulating or at least putting its own um, impression on your experience? Yeah. Well, you see, one of the you see, it's so tricky and it, it's it's really very hard it's incredibly hard to pin down so much so that if for example if i hold the point of view of oh i'm like really trying to track what tico and try to like you know tune into what are the clues of what tico that point of view could itself be the working right. of what tico through my mind you know, it's almost like here's the devil who's inspiring us to go in search of the devil. And right. we're all like, oh, let's find this this demon. But the demon is inspiring the very search and he's behind the scenes just laughing. So, you know, because the thing about Watiko, it's a shape-shifting bug and it's a trickster, you know. And as soon as you feel like, oh, there it is and, you know, I'm going to catch it. Well, you know, guess what? You've fallen under its spell. And so it really is, in a way, it's teaching you about your own mind's facility, you know, to fool yourself, particularly through our own projections. Because part of the way projections work will project onto an inkblot, you know, the inkblot being this waking dream. And it's so easy then to assume, based on how the inkblot reflects, that it objectively exists, separate from us. And then we react to that, thinking we're reacting to something outside of ourselves when we're actually reacting to our own mind. And so how, what I'm basically pointing at is that the thing about Watiko, if you hold it in a certain way, it can really, it can teach you this. It's just like when the Buddha, when the Buddha was sitting under the Bodhi tree, you know, right before he became enlightened, all of the, the negative, for the evil forces of Mara came, you know, to torment him and distract him. And from one point of view, oh, those were all the obstacles that were, you know, not wanting him to wake up. But from another point of view, no, they were secretly Buddha's allies. They helped him to develop the muscle of realization. He wouldn't have been able to catalyze himself over the edge into realization without those forces. So they were actually on his side, you know. And so that's that's a really, really interesting, you know, and that that just it's like it's like the thing about Watiko, it's like going to the to the gym, going to the psychic gym, it helps to build up the very muscles that you need in order to have realization, but only if you hold it in a certain way. If you then don't, you know, hold it in that way and get and act it out or identify with it or absorb or react to it or judge it, then you're unwittingly becoming an instrument that's feeding it. It's a fine depth, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. So the Absolutely. last question, I know you're getting close to your, your, your end here. Uh, the last yeah. question that I ask everybody is yeah. um, if, if you could say something to humanity, if you could make a public service message or something, just if you could speak to people, yeah. what, would, what would you say? Well, okay. I mean, I, I would say a lot of things. I mean, basically, you know, there's a lot that comes up. One thing in the moment that just came up is that um, we as the human species, we're these um, geniuses intrinsically we're we're this genius species and but by but because we're unconscious of the full extent of our genius one way to understand this think about a dream if you're in a dream you hold a viewpoint in the dream the dream has no choice but to spontaneously shape shift and reflect our viewpoint and if we're not aware of that incredible gift of our genius to like co-create reality in that dream we then become entranced by our own mind, thinking that the dream is separate from us. And, and then we, you know, we, and as soon as we then relate to the dream as objective, reciprocally in that same moment, we've created ourselves as a subject to that objective world. Those two are the same processes, the objective universe and the subjective experience. That's a reference point separate from the objective universe. Those reciprocally co-arise. 
that's a way of describing Watiko, because then we've caught ourselves in samsara, in the endless round of death and rebirth, where we're just reacting, and the more we hold that viewpoint, the more the dream is going to reflect back the truth of it, sending us all the evidence, and now we have even more evidence to get entrenched in our viewpoint ad infinitum. But that's our own, that's an expression of our own genius. The fact that we have this incredible genius to actually create our experience of the world and of ourselves, but because we're unconscious, it's like we have this magic wand, but we're wielding it unconsciously in a way that's self and other destructive. So I guess the one, to answer your question, the one thing I would say is for any of us, for any one of us, or for as many of us as possible, to just inquire into this experience where this isn't some sort of theory, this isn't an idea, this is like the Buddha was saying, don't take my word for it, do the experiment yourself, be an empiricist, see if what I'm saying is true, inquire into the present moment nature of your experience and see if what I'm actually describing is true and when you discover that, that's when you actually connect with your own creative agency. If you remember, I was answering a previous question by saying the profound importance of accessing the creative. And the creative, interestingly, the, the daimonic, one of the definitions of the daimonic is the not yet made real creative. So encoded in that daimonic energy, that archetypal energy, is the creative energy. But if we don't express it constructively, it becomes destructive. So that's really our situation, that any one of us, to the extent that we're able to really have insight into this process and connect with our voice, with our creative powers, with our, with our true power, with our nature, which is compassion and joy and love, that's the extent that we're then really um, being, you know, able to be of help to the world and to be able to genuinely make a difference in what's happening. And if we aren't doing that, then we're actually part of the problem. Well, thank you so much. You know, I, I would recommend anybody who, who gets a chance to see this, read your book. Dispelling with Tico. It's, it's, uh, I, it's a wonderful I appreciate book. that. Thank you so much, really. And I think that, that you're so good at, 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 um, at disseminating your knowledge that it, it, it's so reasonable that I think people who haven't thought like this can follow it and can be made to see some things, which I well, always admire. I admire people that can, that, can, that can wield words well enough. Well, keep in mind this whole why I think whatever facility I have has come out of like this enormous initiatory ordeal of intense suffering. And somehow I've been able to hold it and I'm still a work in progress. It's not like, oh, I'm this like, you know, enlightened person having come out the other side. But why I'm even saying this is to sort of maybe be like an example for other people that, yeah, I, it was, it was unbelievably, you know, challenging and difficult for me. And yet I was able to go into it in a way where, you know, to access certain understanding that's actually helping me and hopefully helping other people. And I think we're all in that same boat. Yeah, well, it's time for all of us to share our, our, our information, our knowledge, and, and, and um, pool it, pool ourselves, right, I think. I think and then, and I'm, I'm happy, to be a, happy to be a part of dispensing your information. Your knowledge. Well, I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Awesome. Totally. Okay, so take care. You too, enjoy your lunch. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay bye bye. Bye bye.